All right. Exodus chapter 17. We're going to kick right into this. We've got a lot to do today. Exodus 17. We're continuing in our simple series and continuing on just talking about Moses. There's, Moses gives us a ton of material to talk about. We've skipped a little bit ahead, but today is Moses' water from the rock. Exodus 17 verses 1 through 7. And our simple series, if you haven't been here, just a reminder, we're looking for clear, not complicated, easy to understand, simplified, transferable principles. And so that's what we're looking to do. When we're looking in Scripture, we're trying to find really simple, easy to understand, transferable principles that we can um, live by, but that also so that we can kind of offload them to other people as we're talking about our faith. So we're saying we want to be simple followers of Jesus. We want to have some very easy, transferable application and principles so that we can share with this world. So, um, so last week, we left Moses at a burning bush. And it's fair to say we picked on Moses a lot. I mean, we really kind of ragged on Moses. He was doing his best to... Uh, deny God's calling on his life. God wanted him to go and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he's like, he kept, kept coming up with all of these excuses, and, you know, oh, I, I can't do it, oh, I don't speak well, all of these things, and God just kind of, he's like, I'll take care of that, I'll take care of that, I'll take care of that, and then he finally, I guess he runs out of excuses, and he's just like, God, I don't want to do this. Okay, please just pick someone else. And that's where we left off Moses. So I, I think we picked on him enough. So obviously it didn't work. Okay, God finally convinced him. He's like, no, I will be with you. Moses, he goes back to Egypt, right? Um, and, and, and I want to point this out. God purposely chose a, a quote-unquote unqualified person to do his work. And we talked about this a little bit last week when Moses said, hey, hey, God, I've got like this, this stuttering problem or I don't speak well in front of people. We don't exactly know what it was. And we kind of expounded on that and saying, hey, you know what? That's God, God said right there, he's like, I created everyone exactly how they are. I'm the person that creates people with, with different things in their lives. Sometimes their, their strengths, sometimes their weaknesses, but it doesn't matter. See, there are no um, necessarily broken people who are, are imperfect. God created them perfectly how he wanted them to be. With all of their, again, imperfections as the world would see. And God says, no, 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 those aren't imperfections. That's exactly how I created you because, see, you can use those things in your life, good or bad, to be able to further his kingdom. So, so God purposely chooses this guy who was really unqualified so that when God does something awesome, everybody's going to look at it and go, that was God. That wasn't Moses. And, and that's the story of my life, at least as I like to see it. I know me. Okay, I'm not all that great or all that cool or know the Bible all that well. None of those things. But see, I also know God. And that's, that's what gives me the confidence to be able to stand up here week after week and talk to you guys for like 30 or 40 minutes every week and give this massive oral presentation, not because I think I'm worthy of this, because I know I have a great God who somehow, some way, he's going to speak to me in the week and give me something that hopefully is helping your lives. That's what God does. God steps into our lives and he fills in all of those gaps and all of those cracks and he equips us with what we need to do to serve him and to further his kingdom. So we've got Moses. He goes to Egypt. Let my people go, that whole thing. They, 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 they have all of the plagues and everything. Finally, Pharaoh lets them go. Um, they're, they're exiting Egypt, and Pharaoh's like, what did I do? No, 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 that's our labor force. And so he chases after them with the army. God parts the Red Sea. The Israelites cross through it. As soon as they get out of it and and the Egyptian army gets in there, God closes up the Red Sea. That whole thing happens. Um, God's leading them through the desert. He's giving them manna to eat and, and quail to eat to keep them nourished. But the people are constantly complaining and griping to Moses. Like they have seen God do all of these amazing, crazy things. And they're still griping and complaining like, God, you need to prove yourself. 
Um, I want to show you here on a map of kind of what we're talking about. So if you see up there, number one in uh, Ramses, that's kind of where they start. They come down a little bit. They cross through the Red Sea or the Suez Canal there, come all the way down. And we're going to be today in about number seven. Can you guys see that Rephidim down there at the bottom? That's where we're going to be um, today. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, a, a a bit of an idea. Now, we're not exactly sure exactly where they went, especially after this. And they did some loops here and there, we think. And so that part doesn't really matter. But I, I want to just show you on a map where they are just in this wilderness or basically in a desert. And that's going to play into this. Now, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever spent much time in a desert? I've spent a little bit of time in a desert, in Israel, actually, and tell me some things about deserts. What do we know about deserts? They're what? Hot. What else? Dry. Okay. Just like sometimes it seems like endless, right? Now, I've not taken, taken that drive through like Texas and all of that. Um, but from what I understand, just driving through Texas and then out through Arizona and Nevada and some of those, I'm not knocking those places, but from what I understand, it just is like like endless territory, and, and if, even if you cross through a desert, it's just like, is this ever going to end? And that's what I believe the Israelites were facing, and they were just barely into their journey, and they were already complaining to God about this. So now, but maybe you have or have not spent much time in an actual desert, but have you spent much time in a desert in life? where there's no answers, and it's confusing, and it's like, God, where are you? Like, this is just endless. I'm never going to get out of this. And unfortunately, what do we start to do at that time? We start to question God. We start to say, hey, God, why did you lead me here to just leave me in this place? That's what the Israelites were uh, experiencing. And the problem is, is at that point when we allow those questions to enter into our mind, it starts to challenge our faith a little bit, and we start to doubt God's goodness. So Exodus chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 1 here. We've just got a, a handful of verses, that's it. So it says, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin. Now it says, it looks like sin, it has nothing to do with the word sin, I believe it's seen, and I think it comes from Sinai, or the Sinai Peninsula, so from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. So God would say, okay, travel to here, stop and camp, travel to here, stop and camp, and, and that's what they were doing. It says, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Now, interesting, this, the word Rephidim, it means the place of rest, or we call it rest stop. Now, when you're traveling on the turnpike and it's a long time and it's like, I'm really thirsty, I need to get a drink, maybe I need to grab a coffee or something or I need to use the restroom, what are we like waiting for? A rest stop, right? And so they make it to the rest stop, but we have a problem. There's no water. And they're traveling for weeks and weeks and weeks in this desert and obviously they didn't go for weeks without having water, but they come to the point where they're like, we have got to get water. Now, Here's the interesting thing. God purposely, or, or we could say God providentially, led them to this place without water. Think about that for a minute. They're in the desert. You, 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 there is no 7-Eleven or Circle K, all right? They didn't have water. I don't know about you, like, I don't like to go, like, two hours without drinking water. And I know the human body can go for a few days, but, like, even to go one day without water, you're miserable. I don't know how long they had gone, but I imagine it was pretty severe. And God led them to a place. So this brings us to a question. What kind of God would do that? What kind of God would lead them to this dry place with no water? I'll answer my own question. It's a God that knows what he's doing and a God that wants to show them his goodness in this situation. 
That's the kind of God that would lead them to a place where they would have no choice but to depend on him. But what did they do? Verse 2. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink, like he could just produce it, right? Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Now, he's getting better. Remember the last two weeks we talked about Moses had a little bit of a problem every time God would speak, Moses would make it all about him. He's getting better because he says, why do you quarrel with me? And then he brings God into it. So he's, he, it, we're making some progress here. Now, why do you put the Lord to the test? According to chapter 16, the chapter just before this, they were six weeks out from the parting of the Red Sea. Six weeks ago, they stood at a massive body of water, not to mention all the plagues that they saw and God moving and doing all that, but just six weeks ago, they saw this big body of water part. That doesn't just happen. Has anybody seen that before? Yeah, me neither. That's not a natural thing. That's God stepping in and saving them from this Egyptian army. Six weeks ago from today was July 28th. It was the end of July. We're, we're just a little bit into September now. That's not that long ago. Now, I imagine if we saw something as great as the parting of the Red Sea just six weeks ago, we'd probably remember it, right? We'd probably say, wow, that's an awesome God that saved us. But here's the children of Israel griping and complaining, going, what kind of God is this? You let us out here to die. What is the problem here? So Moses said, why do you put the Lord to the test? Now that word test, what he is saying here, the word also could be tempt. And the the original word is nasa. It means to put someone to the test to see if they are faithful or not. Or another way to say it, to put someone to the test to see if they will act in a certain way. The Israelites were, were... making such a deal, they were going, hey, we'll see about this God. We'll see if God is really as good. You better bring us water, or God, you're not as good as you say you are. Ooh, that's some scary words to say. I would be very cautious about standing near them when they say that, right? Because you think lightning's going to come at any second. They're, they're almost tempting God to say, God, I don't believe your goodness. You need to prove it to me now. <laughs> Listen, God had done so much already. I'll go through this list again. He delivered them from the Egyptians using all these plagues. Part of the Red Sea saved them from the Egyptian army. God's presence was literally leading them around, right? A cloud by day, a pillar of fire at night, and leading them from place to place, speaking to them, speaking to Moses. Um, He gave them honey buns from heaven, right? Manna was like wafers that that were like soaked in honey, okay? Not bad. That's that's pretty cool. I wish I, you know, got some of that to eat. I don't know if I want to eat it for 40 years, but just saying. And then he also gave them quail to eat. Like, here is a God that keeps coming through for them, and all they want to do is they want to test God to see if he's really good. Hmm. Here's the funny thing about that. They're putting God to the test, because that's what that word means, nasa. All the while, God is testing them to see if they really are going to be faithful to him. And I just wonder if sometimes in our situations, when, when, when things arise in our lives, that we ask that question, God, if you're really good, dot, 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 and you, you just fill in the blank with whatever your thing is. And all the while, God's going, See, this isn't about me. This is actually about you and whether or not you're going to trust me in this. Here's our first point. Simple followers of Jesus allow their trust in God's goodness to overcome their confusion from God's inactivity. Now, I I, kind of struggled a little bit with that word inactivity because we know behind the scenes God is doing something But to us, at least here in this life, it looks like God's not doing anything. 
And, and, and this, this is kind of a point that we make pretty often. And, and I was like, I kind of say this in different ways a lot. And then I was kind of like, well, I'm not making this up. This is what God is revealing to me in Scripture. If it keeps coming up in Scripture, maybe we need to hear it like over and over and over again, right? But what we need to allow just, just God and what we've seen in his goodness before to drive our, our feelings and actually just get rid of our feelings and just say, hey, God, I've seen you be good before. I, I, I know you can and you will be good. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm really interested to see, God, how you're going to come through and make this situation okay. But, God, I, I'm just going to trust you because I know you are a good God. We have sayings about this, right? If I say, God is good, you say, all the time. And I say, all the time. And you say, God is good. Okay. That's it. That's the end of the whole saying. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Yeah, but what about this? No, no, there are no what abouts in that. God is good all of the time. God's people didn't trust in God's providence, in God's foreknowledge of, hey, I love you, I will take care of you, I've got you, just trust me. And oftentimes when we're in that desert way longer than we ever wanted to, that very well may not have been God's plan to leave us in that desert for that long. And he's going, would you just please get the lesson? And we're fighting against it and we're fighting against it. And God's like, just get it and I'll release you out of this. But I want you to learn I love you that much that I'm going to allow you to go through this so that you will learn to cry after me, to follow me. To not worry about what your circumstances look like, but to fully trust in me. Simple followers of Jesus allow their trust in God's goodness to overcome their confusion from God's inactivity. Verse 4, then Moses cried out to the Lord. That's it. That's as far as we're going to go. What did he do? Moses is finally getting it. We're seeing him mature in his faith here. He cried out to the Lord. They're griping at him, and we're going to see here in just a minute. It it was a lot worse than it it looked so far. And Moses goes right to God. Here's our second point. Simple followers of Jesus run straight to the source for everything. And, of course, I say the source, that's God. Running straight to the source for everything. No matter what. Good situation, go to the source and thank him. Bad situation, go to the source and and, and plead with him. God, I know you are good. I know you can do this. I know you will deliver me somehow. Would you please? Simple followers of Jesus run straight to the source for everything. It's always, always the best response. Now, I'll ask you a question again. I always like to turn this back on ourselves. When things get difficult, do you run to the source of living water? Is that where you run? When, when things get difficult or challenging or we don't understand or we can't take it anymore and God, I don't know if I can make it another day, do you run straight to the source of living water or we often run to, I came up with some examples here, they all start with an S so you can easily remember them, we run to someone to complain to. Ooh, it's true, right? We often go gripe before we go to God to say, hey, God, I've got a problem. I've got a need. God, would you come through for me? We go complain to somebody. So someone to complain to. We often run to substances. We often run to social media. Okay, you ever seen anybody rant on social media before? You ever think he might have just not Put that on there, okay? Just to, to, to bleh, word vomit all over social media. Maybe just, just that's probably between you and God, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe you haven't seen that before. Um, we run to sleep. That's a coping mechanism for a lot of people. Um, or we run to shiny objects, or we like to call it retail therapy, right? And we often run to these other things instead of running straight to the source of living water. God's like, 
I'm, I'm right here, I'm ready, and I'm waiting for you to come to me, but you're running to all these other things, so I'm going to allow you to stay in this desert until you can come to me, until you come to the source. Here's just a couple of verses here. Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. He withholds no good thing from those who walk blamelessly. He, he's like ready to pour out his blessing and his goodness on us. But are we ready to accept it? Are we ready to take it? Isaiah 58, 11, which I love the passage of Isaiah 58, such a big passage. You can go read it on your own some other time. It says, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in where? Dry places, kind of fitting for our message today, right? And make strong your bones, and you shall be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters don't fail. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to be the source, but do you run straight to him, or do you run to other things? Back to verse 4. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? Now here it is. They are almost ready to stone me. Now a minute ago we just saw that they were griping at him. And he's saying it's so bad that they are ready to kill me. Like that's how ticked off they are. They're going to drag him out and stone him to death. I bet he went and pleaded to the Lord. And in this attempt to be their earthly deliverer, (laughs) <laughs> the, the, the Israelites were just ready to kill him. Now, think about this. Do we know of any other story where somebody came to be a deliverer to his own people and they ended up killing him? Jesus, right? So we kind of look at that like Moses is a picture of Jesus and people are like, yeah, see, the Bible, I don't really believe the Bible because the Bible's just a bunch of made up stories and da, da, da. No, no, no. The Bible is this very intricately woven text that thousands of years apart shows picture after picture after picture of Jesus who was coming. This entire book right here is all about Jesus, even right here in this passage, and we'll see that here in just a little bit. But Moses, he's like, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. He was at his wit's end. He didn't know what else to do. He was like, God, I, 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 I'm done. They, they are going to stone me. They are going to put me to death. I need to know what to do. There's this great verse, James 1.5. You've heard it a million times. I love this verse because I don't consider myself a really smart guy, and I love this verse. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, which I would go, that's me right here. I'm going to be the first to admit, that's me. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Whew. That's a good verse for me. Because again, like, I, I, I am not, I'm, I'm let you in on a little secret. I am not qualified to stand in front of you right now in this moment, okay? Just being honest. It's church. We can be honest with each other, right? So I have to go to God and say, hey, God, I need a word. I need wisdom. I need the ability to get words out of my mouth in front of people that actually they can understand and say, hey, this is something that I can apply to my life and use it and see how God wants to grow my life and help me further his kingdom. Do you run to the source and say, hey, God, I need wisdom. God, I need to know what to do in this situation. God, I need you now. I wrote this question down. Are you fervently seeking God's help when you are at your wit's end? When, when you don't have the strength or the capacity or, or you just don't know if you can keep going, you're at your wit's end, are you fervently seeking God's help? Is that the source that you're running to? I'll ask it this way. Is that your default response to run to God? Or maybe are you running to some of those other things that we talked about? A true sign of spiritual maturity is not how you act on a Sunday morning or around other believers. It's just not. Now, now I, I want you to come here. I want you to worship. I want you to just give praise to God. I want you to get a word. 
But this hour or hour and 15 minutes, depending on how long I talk, this is not the sign of your spiritual maturity on, on even how often you make it to church or how you act inside of this building. Okay, that, that doesn't show me how spiritually mature you are. And, and guess what? That goes for myself as well. Because I kind of have to be spiritual, spiritually mature on a Sunday morning, right? But the real test is how you act when life gets hard and when you can't control what's happening. That's the real test of spiritual maturity. That's the real test to see if any of this stuff that I'm giving you on Sunday mornings is actually helping or what you're learning in your Bible study or your life group or just in your devotion or whatever it is. That's what's going to show you how spiritually mature that you are. Because if your default response is to just blow off the handle or run to one of those other things or whatever else it is and not go straight to the source... Things are just going to be harder than they ought to be. And, and, and I, I promise you, just because I, I, I know some of the character of God, and God's going, just come to me. Just, just, just come to me. I'm waiting for you. I, I'm, I'm like, yes, I put you in that situation, or I allowed you to be in that situation. But just, just I'm waiting for you to come to me. Why won't you do it? You run into all of these other things. Just come to the source. Back to verse 4. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Verse 5. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Now, we're going to see this staff a little bit today, and then we're going to see it next week, too. Kind of funny thing, I sat down to write my sermon this week, and I actually wrote a whole sermon on the next set of verses. And then I was like, wait a minute, we're not going to really dive into this whole, you know, uh, hitting the rock for water thing. So I wrote a whole other sermon. So I'm a week ahead. It's, this is great. This is just like the best thing ever, okay? But we're going to see this staff even more tomorrow. But this, this staff is a symbol. It's important. He says, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Now, I want you to look and see how that's worded. It says, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Now, they, they were kind of in this region, but like the rock sounds pretty specific, right? Like they're in a desert and they're in mountains. Like that's pretty much all there is. So it's kind of weird that he says, go to the rock at Horeb. He says, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Here's our last point. Simple followers of Jesus trust God will not direct you into a desert without presenting a source of provision. God's never going to direct you into the desert without giving you some source of provision. He's going to take care of you. He's not going to lead you into a place and just, well, I hope it works out for you. I, I, I hope you figure this out. That's not how God works. He never has, and he never, ever will. Here's just three verses. There's so many verses. I had such a hard time selecting which verses to show here. Philippians 4, 19, and my God will meet all your needs, not your wants, but meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 37, 25, I was young and now I am old. Thank you for that amazing insight, David. Yet, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Luke 12, 24, I love this one. Jesus, Jesus was the master storyteller, right? I really appreciate storytellers, and Jesus was so good at this. He'd be outside just, just preaching and teaching this a crowd, and he would see something and just start talking about that, or they were by the Sea of Galilee, and he'd talk about fishing, or he'd talk about uh, agriculture, things that they knew, and, and it, it doesn't give us this indication in Scripture, but in, in, in my simplistic mind, I like to picture Jesus there and he says consider the ravens and 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 he's he, he might I don't know he might be like there might be some birds there eating something or some some ravens were you know flying by and he saw them or they were 
calling in the back. I don't know if ravens call or they chirp. I don't know what ravens do. But like there were probably some ravens there. And, and he's like, you know, oh, yeah, like, like consider the ravens. So he uses them as an example. He says, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. He's like, listen, listen, they're just birds. Like, like, they're, they're like okay, a cute little bird, you know. No, Jesus is going, listen, as far as, as you and I are concerned and how much I love my creation, humanity, people, those are just birds. And they don't, they don't plant they don't harvest. They don't store up things in storehouses. Now, I'm not saying be lazy. There's, that's a whole other lesson, okay? He's like, but that's not what I created them to do. I just created them to fly around and fi- find food to eat, okay? And they are taken care of. And then Jesus says this, of how much more value are you than the birds? Like, if those are just birds and they're being taken care of, you're so much more valuable to me than that. I will take care of you no matter what. Again, I keep saying this, does he allow us to be in a desert sometimes so we can get it, so somebody else can get it? So I don't know, that keeps coming up every week, right? I don't know why. But he has a purpose, and he is always good. And he can always be trusted. Now I want to show you one more picture. Now, don't get too geeked out about this, okay? We, we don't know if this is the rock, okay? A lot of people think this might be the rock. We don't know. This is at Horeb. So, and also, I wanted to show the picture because, well, it's just a bunch of rocks and sand and dust and dirt, right? So that's what they were experiencing. And, and you see how big this rock is and how small this person is right there. And I, I probably did way too much of a rabbit hole deep dive into this this week. But they think this possibly could be the rock because it's, it's, there are no other rocks around there like that. And it has this big split down the center. I don't know. Okay? I just thought it was a cool picture. Okay? But I wanted to show you this is what their situation looked like. Dry, without water, confused, miserable, thirsty, didn't know what else to do, but they didn't run to the source. And what I didn't say before, verse 6, I'll read it before we go on to verse 7. It says, I will stand before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses Moses did this in the sight of the elders. You know what the very next verse says? Here it is, verse 7. It says, and he called the place Masa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means strife, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, that's the end of this story. What a bunch of whiny babies, right? Like they had seen God all do all of these amazing things. You know what the story doesn't give us? How awesome it was when the rock came, when the rock just started spewing water. Like, like it was probably not a little trickle or a stream. It probably gushed out like, like it was probably one of those things where Moses is like, okay, you know, and he hits it and kind of runs away because all this water just starts gushing. Like, we don't know how many Israelites there are, a million, two million, hundreds of thousands. That's a lot of water to just start rushing out of this rock. And Scripture doesn't say anything about that. Why? I'll ask it this way. Do, do you think that if the people were grateful or, or, or maybe back up just a little bit, if they actually got together and prayed and worshiped God and said, hey, God, we know you're good. We're going to die out here in the wilderness if you don't come through. So, God, we trust your goodness. We trust you no matter what. You are good. I think maybe if that were the case there might be a little more written about the story. It may give us a little more clue, but it doesn't. The story just ends there. 
Think about like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were faced, to, they were going to be thrown into the furnace, right? And what were their words beforehand? They're like, hey, listen, go ahead. God's going to deliver us. They're like, hey, God's got us. But that's not the only thing they said. They said, God, God's going to deliver us out of this. But, but even if he doesn't, what's, whoa, 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 no, no, no. You've got to have faith that God's going to, no, no. They're like, hey, even if he doesn't, we're good. God's good. Get to go to him. That's fine. No problem. See, that's the attitude that God is looking for us to have. And this story just kind of ends at this sad story. Except we see a little bit of the ending of the bigger story later on in the Bible. And so turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's real easy to find. It's right before 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now here's Paul. That was a joke. That here's Paul, and he's kind of giving the history of the Israelites, again, a couple thousand years later. And we're going to get the end of the story, but it's not really the end of the story like we wanted to. Now, when Paul's explaining this, what he's trying to do is tie this into Jesus. And he was really good about that, of making everything this picture of Jesus. Again, this entire book is about Jesus. Everything is somehow intertwined, interwoven, and tied into Jesus. And so Paul is, is talking about this, talking about this account of the Israelites being led out of Egypt and, and being fed this food and, and given water to drink from the rock. And then he, then he ties in the rock is Jesus and, and all of this stuff. But listen to how the story ends. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So again, referring to this rock here at Horeb, but really more making it a, a picture of Jesus, okay? The spiritual rock. And then here's the end of our story. Here's how it worked out. Because they were such a bunch of griping, complaining, just, just untrusting people. Verse 5, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Not the ending you were hoping for, was it? It's because they didn't go to the source. Sad, sad ending. But how different it would be if instead of complaining about their situation, they prayed earnestly for a solution. How different this story would go. And so again, I'll close with this. I want to turn it back on us, myself included. How different would your situation be if instead of complaining about your situation, you prayed earnestly for a solution. I don't know what you're going through. You're probably going, how, how do they say that? You either just went through something, you're going through something, or you're getting ready to go through something. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I know, it's just, this is just great today, right? That's just life. We live in a fallen, broken world. And God, yes, allows us to go through things, sometimes to shake us, to get our attention, to say, hey, dummy, look at me, focus on me. I'm, I'm here, I'm waiting for you, I'm knocking at your door. Come, come, come to me, come to me. And so often we fight it. What if we didn't? What if instead of complaining about our, our situation, we, we just prayed, hey, God, I trust you no matter what. You deliver me from the fire, great. I, I, if, if it counts, that's my vote. Deliver me from the fire, okay? But if not, I still trust you. I, 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 God, I'm, I'm still okay because I know your goodness. Because, let me let you in on another little secret. God doesn't have to prove his goodness to you. In fact, he kind of already did that, didn't he? There's a symbol of it right there. 
where 2,000 years ago, he hung on that cross, naked, beaten, and bled out everything he had for us. So if God never did anything else for you, that's enough. If he never delivered you from another thing, if he never gave you another drop of water, if he never gave you another breath in your lungs, that's enough. But I'll ask you, is it enough for you? What would it look like instead of complaining about our situation? We prayed earnestly for a solution. So here's our three points. Number one, simple followers of Jesus allow their trust in God's goodness to overcome their confusion from God's inactivity. Number two, simple followers of Jesus run straight to the source for everything. And number three, simple followers of Jesus trust God will not direct you into a desert without presenting a source of provision. Let's pray. God, you are so good. God, thank you that you love us enough that you want to grow us. God, that you want us to mature and that, God, you allow us to go through things. God, if if we were handed everything on a silver platter, we wouldn't need you. If this life was perfect and we never had any problems, God, we, we wouldn't ever go to you. So, God, thank you for the trials. Thank you for the deserts in our lives, God, that keep us coming back to you. But God, help us. Help us, Lord, to turn to you, to go to the source. God, help us to trust you with everything that we have, even when it looks like we will not be delivered. Help us to know that you are still good. You don't have to prove yourself to us. You've already done that. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ hung on that cross for us. God, I know that there are people here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, maybe they've done the church thing for a while or they're counting on their good works or they just have no clue what this is all about. Right now in this moment, God, would you convict their hearts? God, help them to know they need a Savior. Not a fire insurance policy, but God, they need a savior in their life to deliver them from their sin. Right now, God, I just pray that your spirit would just invade hearts. God, right now and this morning, just turn people to you. heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never committed your life to him, I want to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Just right where you're seated, just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you. I'm tired of doing this on my own. God, come into my life. God, save me. God, change me. I trust that Jesus hung on a cross to pay for my sin. And I accept that free gift of salvation so I can spend eternity with you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out or make any deal of it, but I just want to be praying for you. Would you just slip your hand up? Say, today's the day I decided to give my life to Jesus. Today is the day that I got this right. I'm not trusting in myself anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, this is all about you. God, thank you that you are good, no matter what our circumstances look like. God, your goodness doesn't revolve around our circumstances. You are just good all of the time. 
God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be a generous church so that we can do awesome and amazing things. God, that we can show people your love in this community and in this world. Thank you, God, for the calling that you have put on our lives to further your kingdom. Help us to do that well. We pray all of this in the awesome, powerful, and amazing name of Jesus.